Cambridge, the afternoon of the 26th of October, 1968. A tall, lean young man with a shaggy, grown-out perm, falling onto the upturned collar of a well-worn, brick-red, crushed velvet jacket, a pink, tie-dyed T-shirt, black tapered jeans and Cuban-heeled boots, is walking along Silver Street. His destination is King's College. Can I help you, sir? I've come to see Mr Forster. Uh, Mr E.M. Forster. Uh, is he expecting you, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I I've come to collect something. I see. Your name, please? Barrett. Mr Barrett. Very good, sir. Turn left, follow the path, keep off the grass, the staircase in the corner. First floor, name on the door. Thank you. The Ballad of Sid and Morgan by Hayden Middleton. Dramatised for radio by Roger James Ellsgood. No. 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 Ah, Forster. Hello, Mr. Forster? Hello? Anyone here? Ah! Oh. Ah. Oh. 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 Not you after all this time. Who are you? My name is Barrett, sir. I'm so sorry, sir. Someone I met told me where I might find you. He said you were open to being visited. And I've come about a picture I painted a few years ago. I think you might have it. He said that he saw you in a pub, having a sandwich lunch with your son. You noticed my painting in the show and you bought it. And I would like to have it back, because it could be my last chance. I really am sorry, sir. I should have written first, but... The person I met, he said he thought it was you who bought my painting. Did he now? Were you here before I fell into my matinee sleep? Uh, no, sir. I I've just arrived. Forgive me, but is it money you are asking for? No, sir. It, it was money that was probably the original mistake, allowing that transaction to take place. That's when it all began, you see. It's a long story, but it wasn't meant to turn out the way it did. Not any of it. I didn't want to sell the painting. It was the wrong thing to do. So now I've got to try to take the path back, sir. Try to put things right. Start again. I see. Rather, I don't see. Sit down. And try to explain the difficulty you are in. Now... You are telling me that you are an artist. Well, I was an art student in London, Camberwell School of Art. And the exhibition you have mentioned was there? Uh, no, it was near here, uh, four years ago. I was 18, living at home. It was before I left for college. Oh, so Cambridge is your place of origin? Yes. And you spoke of a pub? Uh, yes, sir, the show was in a pub out Milton Way. Figurative paintings mainly, several were of bicycles and... One of my paintings was sold. Was the painting in question of a bicycle? Yes, it could very well have been. You are not certain? Uh, no, I'm afraid it was a long time ago, sir. Quite a lot has happened in the meantime. And now I should very much like to have it back. Uh, that is, 
if you have it. Leaving aside for a moment the question of whether I have this item, may I ask why its tracking down is of such importance to you? It was a mistake. To have made the painting or to have had it sold? No, selling it. Look, I'm fully prepared to pay for it. And... Should you recover this painting, what will then happen? What would you do with it? I might very well destroy it. And you believe that such a gesture would put things right, as you phrased it? Probably. Mm. Does this painting carry a signature? It might be signed, yes. In which name would that be? It may possibly just say Sid. That is your name? It's a name I've had. Well, there's no accounting for parental choice, but I should not have had you down for a Sydney. But what I do with the painting isn't really the issue, sir. Anyway, it could well be too late now, and it may not have been you at the pub. My dear boy, I have not yet said I'm not your man. But you have given me surprisingly little to go on. Tell me, the man who directed you here, is he a person you know well? Uh, no, it was someone I met at the BBC about a year ago. I, I didn't know him at all, we just got chatting. He told me he just happened to be in the pub when the exhibition was on. This was after you graduated from your school of art? I didn't finish the course at Camberwell. I left during the second year. You left to work at the BBC? No, I left to do something else. Something which didn't, in the end, work out. I should be interested to know what that was. It doesn't matter. It's all over now. There was something once, but not anymore. First there was nothing, and then I had something for a very short while, but now there's nothing again. So what do you do with your time? Sir, I do nothing. Uh, that's why I've come for the painting. To see if I can go back to being a painter and start again on the path I should have stayed on. I'm sorry, sir. All I need to know is whether it was you in the pub that day and if you bought my painting. One thing I can tell you with certainty about that day is that I was not lunching upon sandwiches or anything else, with my son. Oh. It has never fallen to me to be a parent. I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me for a moment. Are you going to fetch my painting? This is my home, young man. So I see no need to account for my movements, but since you ask, I have medications to take. I'm not asking you for any favours. I'm willing to pay much more than you probably paid for it. I've got the cash. Look. Go back in, please, and sit down. There won't be a moment. Sorry, sir, I just saw your piano and wondered. No, 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 no. Carry on. It hasn't been played for years. Probably a bit out of tune. Yes, it is. Just a bit. <laughs> oh dear, we're being interrupted. Coming! Sir, sorry to disturb you. I've just bought you some fresh bed linen oh. and your laundry. Oh, thank you, my dear. Oh, and I found this £20 note outside your door. Oh, yes. Yes, I think I know who may have dropped it. Ah. Yes, yes, thank you very much. You may leave it with me, and if it does not belong to the gentleman who is at present calling on me, I shall make other inquiries on the staircase. All right. Uh, would you please step inside and put the laundry on the table, please? I'll see you to it later. Oh, certainly, sir. My word! What is it? It's nothing, sir. Gosh, I'll, I'll be on my way. Sorry. I'll just step outside, with you? Can I ask what it was that startled you, my dear? The man playing the piano, sir. What about him? He's... well, he is a god. That is Sid. Sid Barrett. A god, you say? Well, well. And how is it that you know him? The way everyone does, sir. He's famous for his music. His music? His records. Gramophone records. We're talking about popular music. 
pop music. Until recently, he used to be the lead singer and guitarist of the Pink Floyd. The Pink what? Uh, the Pink Floyd, sir. They're a group. They play um, spaced out psychedelic music. Psychedelic music? What a word. They do these amazing liquidy light shows, like melting colours and blobs and bubbles playing all over them when they do concerts. <laughs> it blows your mind. Oh, you hear that tune he's playing? It's called Bike. Ah. I've got a bike, you can ride it if you I see. It's on their album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. What's that you say? The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, sir? Their first LP. Oh, now that is intriguing. Oh, but Sid left the group earlier this year. They weren't getting on. Oh, there was this too, sir. I, f I found it by the money. I wasn't sure if I should just... You know, but seeing as it's him, it's likely well, his. Would you wish me to give this cigarette to Mr Barrett too? I think he'd appreciate it, sir. Well, I will. Thank you. But I'll be on my way then if there's nothing else I can do, sir. No, no. Thank you. You've been most helpful. You're welcome, sir. Well, uh, the piper at the gates of dawn. Now, oh, where is it? Oh, too many books. Ah, oh, here it is. Leave that for a moment, if you would please, and come and sit down again. I have something to show you. Yes, of course. Sorry, I was getting carried away. No, sure, sure. I've looked out something for you. A book. The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. First edition. Here. Please, look inside. Chapter 7. The piper at the gates of dawn is of the most immediate relevance. Sounds familiar. Oh, uh, did you, um, did you know about this newspaper cutting? Oh, yes. Yes, a little memento. The TLS, 1908. A review of Mr Graham's book alongside one for my A Room with a View. Echoes of the Piper could be heard in the work of many of us back then. Now, I'm not much of a drinking man, but in that cupboard over there, you will find the decanter of what I regard as some passable sherry and some glasses. Could I ask you to pour us both measures? And please feel no need to stint. Of course, sir. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. I don't quite get how you know uh, that this book has meaning for you. There really is no mystery. While you were playing, the bedder brought my laundry. You must have seen her. Uh, no. Well, she seemed to know you, and I inquired of her how. She spoke most highly of you. She also gave me some items which you likely dropped from your pocket on the landing, but we shall return to those. You would seem to be a person of some stature in the world of psychedelic music. Oh, right. I confess that before today I had not heard of psychedelic music. My friend Aldous Huxley's preferred descriptive term for the narcotics he administered to himself was phenerothyme, which I accept is not quite so euphonic, but it means much the same thing. You are aware, perhaps, of Huxley's work in this field, his The Doors of Perception and... Heaven and Hell. Yes, I am, sir. Do you know all this Huxley? Knew. Alas, knew. Yes, the poor fellow died on the same November day President Kennedy was lost to us. The young bedder said your music blows one's mind and I've heard similar expressions from others regarding the effects of certain narcotics on the path to enlightenment. Look, sir, 
It's very good of you to take an interest, but this really isn't what I've come about. I just want my painting back. The music thing is all over for me. I thought going into music might provide an interesting diversion, but it took me away from where I needed to be. I really don't want to talk about that now. Oh, but you must. I mean to say, if you cannot talk to a new comrade, then to whom can you talk? You were part of a group, a pop musical group, like those four rather refreshingly irreverent boys from Liverpool. Yes, sir, I was, for a while. And people danced to your music. They tried to. Yeah, but that became more difficult. Everything did. The group became a commercial success, but that wasn't really part of the plan. I mean, we did want fame, but then we got it. So you decided to leave the group? Or did the others leave you? I sense there was a falling out. Not as such. I mean, they were my friends. I grew up with some of them, went to school with them. There wasn't any kind of war between us. It wasn't like that. I think they just wanted another kind of success to the sort I wanted. We had a, a different attitude to things generally. I think that was the issue. And that difference translated into making the music? Yes. And actually, I, I didn't think we were especially good. Not even musically proficient. Apart from Rick, the keyboard player. He should have been in a jazz band. I'm not disowning what we did. I just don't think we really gelled as a group of people. But as you said, you've had substantial success. The better referred to you as a god. Oh, I'm not a god, sir. Uh, Bob Dylan, uh, he's what you can call a god, not me. Please to go on. Well, it was the times as much as anything else. Swinging London and so on. Young people got swept up, swept along. We all did. It was the right thing at the right time for me. I guess I got lucky. I fell on my feet, but without really finding my feet, if you know what I mean. But because I was really a painter and not a musician, the whole time I was just running to catch up. And sometimes I needed a bit of assistance. I assume you're referring to the agents of psychedelia. Yes, but that was far from the whole story. There was more to it than that, much more. Oh, yes, yes, of course. All I'm saying is that... I wasn't particularly special. I wasn't especially deserving. Could have happened to anyone. Well, you must at least have looked the part. Probably. But the real question isn't why I left the group. It's why I joined in the first place. Because all I ever really wanted to do was paint. And all I want right now is time away from the music to have a break and get back to being a painter. So what sent you down the wrong path? I don't know. Several things, probably. The main one, I think, was my father dying. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. Did this happen recently? No. Seven years ago. Cancer. He must have been relatively young. Uh, not much past 50. He was a scientist, a pathologist. He was actually the morbid anatomist and histologist at this university. Oh, how very interesting. Now, um, there can't be much sherry left in the decanter. I suggest we polish it off. Yes. Why not? Close to your father? I was, sir, yes. I wish I'd known him longer. And you would have been precisely how old at his death? Nearly 16. I assumed there would be more time. I wasn't really ready for him to be gone. There is no good time to be deprived of a parent. Although my feelings were perhaps not so closely involved, losing my father can be seen as the defining moment of my life. My bringing up lacked a significant male figure. As a small, fatherless Victorian child, my widowed mother and maiden aunts did insist on growing my hair and putting me in dresses. 
Do you think that had your father lived, these seven years may have taken a different course? Have you missed a father's supervision? Is it possible that without it you allowed yourself too much freedom? The agents of psychedelia, which we earlier discussed, the doors of perception and so forth. Maybe. Maybe something like that. But in your sorrow, you tried to lose yourself in music as a way to escape. No, not, not lose myself, to find my father. Through music, I, I thought I might... I wondered if music could be a kind of doorway to my dad. And for a time, it seemed it might be. And then it became too late. The music was never meant to last, but it took over. Suppose I always knew it would, really. You know, music could be a strange thing. Sometimes I sit here and read old Eliot's four quartets aloud. One passage posits that some music is heard so deeply that it is not actually heard at all. Rather, one is the music. For as long as the music lasts. Yes. So now... In coming here, you are seeking to turn back the clock in order to undo all that you say has gone wrong for you since, effectively, you renounced the world of fine art. And by way of the symbolic act of retrieving a painting which you believe should never have been exchanged for filthy lucre, the genie can be returned to the bottle. I hope so. But what if the genie prefers to stay out in the open air? Well, then the game really would be up. <laughs> well, that would be it, wouldn't it? The outer darkness. I mean, what else would there be? I'd have to load my pockets with stones and walk into the cam. Well, could you not paint and draw simply to meet your own needs? That's all I've ever done. I, I never painted or drew for anyone else. I never sought commercial success. Well, not in that field, anyway. But right now I have to make a living somehow, find somewhere to live, and then perhaps... Tell me, were you gifted as a painter? Perhaps. Where's your home as a point of interest? Do you still have one in Cambridge? Uh, well, my mother still lives on Hills Road. <laughs> with its many privet hedges. Yes. I'm staying with her at the moment. I lived with my own mother until I was past retirement age. You haven't always lived here? Oh, I thought... It only seems I've been here since the dawn of time. Though I should imagine I've been here for the entirety of your life... When were you born? January the 6th, 1946. Well, there you have it. Exactly the year of my coming here. Or rather, my coming back here. I took my undergraduate degree here at the turn of the century. It doesn't do to stay around a place like Cambridge one's whole life. It is, I think, for the very old or the very young. In the middle years, one should go away, gain experience. There's still plenty of time for you to come back. Hmm. So... January the 6th, that would make you exactly 67 years and five days younger than I. So you were born on New Year's Day? Yes, in 1879. I came out of the 19th century. We belonged to different epochs, you and I. But the alignments of the stars would have been the same. We both, of course, were born under the sign of Capricorn, the sea goat. There we are. Our January births make us two of a kind, the old goat and the young kid. <laughs> Your plight, though, makes me anxious, this talk of walking into the can. And your mother must be anxious, too. Is she aware of how things stand? It's bitter enough to lose a father, how much more bitter to lose a son. A deprivation of which I've had some experience, albeit... At a remove. But what I would like to ask is why, at this early stage in your life, you regard the stakes as so very high. I mean, to say, to all intents and purposes, you're still a free agent. And having started out with what one might term certain advantages, like many in your generation, you may continue to do with your life virtually as you please. I cannot see why you should not be riding on magical cushions of air, the prince of all you survey. But would I be correct in thinking that you define yourself by what you create? No. No, that's not what motivates me. It's more... Well, 
I think I'd like to make my case rather than my mark. Is this why you feel that otherwise there may be no point in going on? I've always known that I need to create things. It's all I can really do. Creativity has never been optional. Making paintings, making music, making everything. Everything. Yes, you know, art, the world, life. Oh, indeed I do. The wondrous muddle. Yes. But recently I've stopped being able to be creative. And because it's gone, it's as if I'm going to kind of... Dying off in instalments. According to the young bedder, your work seems to mean so much to many people. You have many followers. She said that your work is widely appreciated. Oh, not by everyone. Outside London, we often had cans and bottles thrown at us. In Dunstable, we once had beer poured over us on stage from the balcony. Oh, there never is any accounting for Dunstable. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Did you always want to be a writer? I am told that at the age of six, my ambitions lay in quite a different direction. I should like to be a flower, I'm supposed to have said, a primrose that nobody picks. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound so bad. I once read something about the act of creation. Let me tell you, when a man creates, it's as if he lets down a bucket into the well of his subconscious and draws up something that is otherwise beyond his reach. He then mixes this something with his normal experiences and out of the mixture comes a work of art. Yes, that does sound a bit like... Now, this process may well be aided by a knowledge of the world and, of course, by ingenuity when it comes to technique, but creativity cannot come about without the stuff in the bucket. And this subconscious stuff does not simply jump into one's bucket whenever one might ask it to. Yes, indeed. But do you see my specific point, that once the work is complete, the creator will wonder how on earth he did it? And of course, he cannot possibly find an answer. I may be barking up quite the wrong tree and seeing things this way, and stuff not simply jumping into the bucket could be dismissed as the most egregious excuse for simply failing to produce art, especially coming from a man who has spent the better part of his life in creative idleness. Are you absolutely sure you wish to finish with the music? Having already covered so much ground to get where you are. I think so, yes. When I was in the band, I got so tired of what we did. There was never any chance to do anything new or different. I always enjoyed experimenting, trying to make new kinds of music, but always having to reproduce the sounds of our records live on stage on a nightly basis. I got locked in. Well, it sounds to me as you became bored. Yes, uh, yes, and I think that that's not at all uncommon in the music world. Uh, even if you are successful, the shine always gets rubbed off what you produce. And as it's turned out, trying to go solo this year has been worse than being in the group. You wish you'd stay? No, no, it's all over. Finito. Oh. Uh, are you all right, sir? Yeah, yeah. oh. Yes, yes, thank you. Just a um, slight dizziness. It happens now and again. Just give me a moment or two to recompose myself. I do apologise. Uh, no, sir, it's I who should apologise for vexing you like this. Please, I am far from vexed. Uh, I suspect indigestion rather than heart lay at the root of what's happening. One might simply say that at this late stage I sometimes annex more than I can govern, that I carry home from the shops more than I can unpack. I shouldn't complain, after all, I'm just a tiny nightlight suffocating in its own wax and on the point of expiring. Uh, I do think I should go, sir. This isn't doing you any good. With respect, that is something for me rather than you to decide. For more years than I can remember, my health has been failing, as is only to be expected. I will not regale you with the list of my debilities, but you may take it that I am not an unfamiliar figure at Adam Brooks Hospital, where your father must also have been well known, I imagine, on the other side of the stethoscope, as it were. Yes, sir. You really don't mind if I stay a bit longer? I insist on it. Thank you. What will not be apparent to you is that apart from my small lapse just now, 
In your company, I have found myself oddly rejuvenated. In speaking with you, I seem to have been granted a remission from my many and varied ailments. It's like having been given a fresh coat of paint, though I fear it will vanish on drying. So how could I not wish to continue enjoying this? You are taking years off me. But before we say another word, it's surely high time for a formal introduction. I'm... Morgan Forster. I was intended to be Henry Forster, but a mix-up at my christening caused me to be given my father's name, Edward. So to avoid chaos in the household, I was called by my middle name, Morgan. It's stuck ever since. Pleased to meet you, sir. Oh, oh, what a cold hand you have. All the better for making pastry, I'm given to understand. <laughs> and I am most glad to meet you, Mr... Roger Barrett, sir. Then you are no longer Sid. Roger's my real name. It's what I'm called by my family, Rog, most of the time. You know, this is peculiar, but ever since the bedder identified you as Sid, the name has seemed to me less and less, um, how shall I put it, applicable to you. Well, it's only a name, but... Um, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's more than a name. It's who I've become, sir. Oh, we must dispense with all these sirs. You must call me Morgan. Oh, yes, sir. Sorry, <laughs> Morgan. Uh, is this you, Morgan? In this photograph? Yes, in my Indian garb, Secretary Waller. In the early 1920s, I worked for the Maharaja of Dewas as his private secretary. One always hesitates to use one's own experience as evidence of anything, but much of what I found in the East helped me to complete my last novel, which finally saw the light of day as long ago as 1924. A passage to India? Yes. But I bring that up only to illustrate to you how long it can take for some work to achieve its finished form. That book was with me for some 11 years. Half your lifetime. Not, I should hasten to say, that I worked at it continuously. It was as if something inside me was inciting me to dawdle and not to concentrate. And then there was the Great War, which of course slowed everyone down. But at so many points along the way, I was convinced that it would never be completed and I would never again write a novel. And yet then, in 1924, there it was. And so, What's been happening since 1924? We may conceivably come back to the subject of me, should we need to, but at present it is your own inquiry we must address. I do not mean in regard to your painting, wider issues. Do you have someone in your life, a girlfriend perhaps? No. Oh, I'm surprised. Surely the gods of your musical world must be spoiled for choice. The ardour of youth and what have you. Yes, but I seem to end up with girls who are never quite right for me. I don't really know how to make a go of things with girls. I've sometimes wondered whether it might have been better if I'd have been a girl myself. Better? Yeah, maybe I should have tried boys instead. Are we alluding to the unspeakable vice of the Greeks? The impulse that destroyed the city of the plain? We could be. Possibly. I I don't know. Are there not others to whom you are close? The people in your musical group, for instance. You said there was no war between you. Do you see them socially? No, not anymore. Why is that? Towards the end, I was becoming less committed than the others. I frequently stopped participating. And then someone, someone I'd known since school, David, he came in. I suppose you could say it was to deputise for me, but he was a much better guitarist than I was. There were four of us to start with, and then five, and then four. It, it was the beginning of the end. One day I was waiting for them to come and pick me up. I was quite prepared, ready and dressed. I wasn't always, but I was that day. We were supposed to be driving down to play in Southampton. and Well, they just didn't come to pick me up. And that was that. Now, I think they'll probably just forget all about me. I very much doubt that. At the time, I felt very hurt. I was very angry. 
<sighs> but it's okay. I'm all right now. I'm all right. Yes. There was something you said earlier. It was about, for want of a better term, your lost inspiration. You said rather nicely that first there was nothing, then something, then nothing again. Mm -hmm. Immediately that struck a chord in my mind, but I could not quite think why. And now I have it. It's Bede and his sparrow. Do you see? Bede? The venerable Bede. Bede writes of a conversation between a Saxon king and his counsellors. This would have been almost a millennium and a half ago. And one of the king's men compares the then current pagan perception of human life to a sparrow's flight through a warm and well-lit feasting hall in winter. In through one door the sparrow flies, then out through the other. And that is all we know of her, this brief period of passage, while to either side all is darkness and unknowing. Where she came from, where she's going, no one could possibly say. Now, the parallel is imperfect, but the apparent arbitrariness in Bede's imagery is what speaks to me. The sparrow, you see, may fly through the hall at any point in one's creative life. There's no telling how much darkness may precede it, nor how much may follow. Or how often the bucket may come up empty. So... You think the time when one isn't creating things is darkness? Um, this is what I wish to come to. I don't believe that I do. I really am not at all convinced that this is the case. One's floruit need not be long, and there is good life to be lived on either side. One's floruit? Latin. Denoting a peak period of activity, that of an artist or movement. It simply means the time in which he flourished. My own follow it is, in retrospect, extremely short. My first novel was published in 1905, and then after the passage it was all up, leaving almost seven of my decades unaccounted for, at least in terms of fiction. And even within those 20 were some 14 fallow years. Morgan, how did you become a writer? Oh... My classics tutor casually mentioned to me one day that he really saw no reason why I shouldn't become a writer. I suppose I must have taken his suggestion on board, since there were always going to be readers with an appetite for stories about the love of men for women and vice versa. But the reasons why we favour one course of action over another are seldom simple. There are many ways of being alive, many doors near to one which someone else's touch may open. Yes. Listen, Roger, you and I have been landed with more privilege than one truly knows what to do with. Thanks to a family legacy, I have been comfortably off ever since I went about in little girl's clothing. Not that we're to be blamed for our good fortune. It just enables us to open the establishment's gates from within. Yes, you're right. Morgan, when you were younger, did you wonder what you might do with the rest of your life? How you might best express your creativity? Well, it had little to do with the subject of creativity. Therefore, I see no cause for this to detain us here. Uh, yes, uh, yes, of course. Sorry. I, I do think I'm overtaxing you, sir. No, you're not. Well, the man at the BBC did say you were open to visitors. Open to visitors? One is not a public convenience. <laughs> but yes, my door is generally not closed. This college is already something of a thoroughfare. But if someone makes a point of seeking me out, I try to be available. But let us return to the subject of your music. For a person still as young as yourself, progress is to be measured not in years, but in months. Right now, you may lack the sense of what lies ahead, but it is surely too soon to step down from your place in the pantheon of musical gods. It feels like the right time. Have you ruled out collaboration of any kind? No. Collaboration is a part of the problem of being in a group. I think being a painter is a solitary occupation. Writers don't collaborate. They do their own thing. So do painters. We must always do what makes us happy. As long as it does no harm. The world can offer great chances of beauty and adventure. One never knows when or what might emerge. But what if nothing does? It has been said of me that my reputation rises with every novel I haven't written. 
and an early retirement in any artistic field does relieve the artist of the need to negotiate mediocrity. Uh, but in comparison with you, what I've produced so far is dreadfully thin. You may say that, but do those who now hail your divinity say the same? At the turn of this century, little did I expect my own thin offerings to endure. But we throw forth our work to the world, and there it must find its own life, the genie in the open air. And let me make this suggestion. I have sometimes wondered whether it suits one's devotees that one has ceased to produce. Our legends become lacquered in interesting ways. For many, I myself have seemed for some while to stand for Edwardian England, an era with which, as a younger man, I felt entirely out of joint. But the England of King Edward Seventh is where much of my fiction is set, so that is what I and my novels have come to denote to people. For them, I embody an age. And who knows, there may be something in that. But what I represent matters more to them than what I am, and this gives me a form of tenure. And you may call what I'm about to say even more misguided, but in the event that nothing more should emerge, having sent down your bucket a few more times, it's not impossible that whether you wish to leave a mark or not, your own legacy may already be assured. To those who follow you, what one was, I have found, is much more important than what one is. Their perception will always be of you as you were during the period of your floridwit. It is a notion for which logic offers little support, but for them, you never grow any older. And it's not immortality, after all, the very least that a god might expect. But here's the rub. These admirers of ours have no option but to grow older themselves. Yet through their endorsement, they give us the chance, if we so wish it, to stay forever young. We, like the gilded children we are, are permitted to go on dreaming. No, it may be even more than this. Perhaps they need us to continue to dream on their behalf. In the minds of those who lionise you, henceforth you and your music may long be associated with our current era in the onward march of England's story. Did you go on dreaming? The act of creation itself presented no problem. My reluctance concerned what I was writing about. What did I know, truly know, about my subject? I, who have never found myself in such a position, never married. You never married? I never married, no. And I knew that I never would marry, well, since I was much the same age as you are now. In 1902, I received a revelation about myself. The important thing, Roger, is to swim with the tide of one's own being. The love of men for women, you see, was not... Are we alluding to that unspeakable vice of the Greeks, Morgan? I very much fear that we are. Lord, what fools we mortals be. <laughs> You're certainly no fool. Oh, I know what I am. What kind of primrose was waiting to be picked? And picked I finally was, well and truly. In subsequent years, I more than made up for lost time. Although, needless to say, my days of feasting with panthers are now some distance behind me. Did you find love? I found people. I have found people whom I have had the good luck to love and the even better luck to be loved by in return. My greatest and most enduring love, a man 30 years my junior, lives at present in Coventry. We are in our own fashion together. He's married with a family, and they're all good people. When I spoke before of the loss of a son, it was to this family that I referred. In the year of your father's death, their son, my godchild, fell ill with Hodgkin's disease. Within a year he died. Nothing for any of us has since been quite the same. The man lunching with me at the pub out Milton Way was not, as you will now appreciate, my son. I suspect the person at the BBC who told you otherwise knew that too. So you see, after producing five novels and a number of shorter stories about the love of men for women and vice versa, there seemed little more that I myself could usefully contribute to such a debate. And of course, in the world of that time, or should I say the England, the case I may have wished to make was not permitted. So you stopped writing fiction? Well, I, 
I stopped allowing what I wrote to be read, at least beyond a certain coterie. There is a novel put away in a safe place. A few further stories. When I am gone, there is a chance these may be allowed to see the light of night. But not before. Never before. I need to be disposed of first. <laughs> what possesses me to vouchsafe all this to you, a perfect stranger, I cannot be sure. It's not happened before. Yet for my own reasons, I am glad that it has happened. Very glad and very grateful. In your company, not only has my tongue been loosened, but I have also found myself getting nearer in what I say to what is in my mind. I have felt today with you often that my speech is being prompted from without by one who knows what I need to say. It has made me feel both out of my character and yet wholly myself. Oh, I am by no means trying to send you on your way, but there is a dinner here in college tonight, which I'm obliged in due course to attend. But we still have a little time before I must go to have my soup. Smoke the cigarette the girl found, why don't we? Morgan, I think I should say this cigarette isn't an... I am perfectly aware of the properties of your cigarette. You must remember I spent a good deal of my time in both the Far and the Middle East with their hashish dives, their opium dens. But tell me, do we observe the correct protocols? Should one pass from left to right or right to left? Although with only two partakers, I imagine it amounts to much the same thing. <laughs> Indeed. Andy Warhol recently said something about Florowitz. He said that in the future, fame will be ever more fleeting, that everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. Only 15 minutes? Hmm. It would have an appeal. He is suggesting a form of Buggins' turn. A quarter of an hour before the mass, then a great deal of pottering about to fill all the other unforgiving minutes. I'm sure you've done more than just potter around since 1924. Here. Thank you. Uh, no, mostly pottering, I would have to say. There's been the odd volume of non-fiction, some journalism, a certain amount of broadcasting on social and political matters. And of course, in the time-honoured tradition, when it comes to creativity, I have addressed the public at some length on just how to do what I myself no longer find it possible to do. Thank you. One has also felt compelled to speak out on behalf of other writers and in defence of freedom of speech in general, as with the Lady Chatterley trial. You spoke at that. It was important to champion him. Lawrence was the greatest imaginative novelist of my generation. So it's you we've got to thank for the permissive society, is it, Morgan? Given that I was just one of 35 expert witnesses speaking up for him, that is a somewhat extreme claim. And at the time, many of us did wonder if he would have defended us in return had he been in a position to do so. But we must not carp, for where would we all be without him, or more properly, his work? It's always the work, you see. Making his way out there in the world, the genie outside the bottle. I think that's about it. Takes yeah. uh, yeah. <coughs> <laughs> Now, here's the thing. While writing the passage, I paid several visits to old Thomas Hardy and his wife down on the outskirts of Dorchester. Mm -hmm. They kept a very grand home. But sharabangs would whiz past outside and the conductor would cry out to his passengers, Home of Thomas Hardy, novelist! <laughs> <laughs> the Hardys found it a trial. Like his work, Hardy's company yielded few opportunities for laughter. He once gave me a guided tour of the graves of all their cats. 
a very great number of graves overgrown with ivy, the cats' names inscribed on headstones. Apparently there have been more cats still whose bodies had not been recovered. And here's the rub, most of them seem to have been run over by trains. <laughs> so I asked Hardy if a railway line ran nearby and he said to me, not at all near, not at all near. I don't know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you something, Morgan? Go on. When I first came in and, and we scared each other, it was as if you weren't just afraid. I mean, from what you cried out, you also seemed to recognise yes, me. Yes, there was some fear. At least until my confusion cleared. Can I ask who you thought I was? Oh, this is Oddly vivid sensation, not in the sense that long ago I wrote of such a moment, but not until today experienced it myself. I felt a sharp pain dart through my head, mm. making me conscious of the exact form of my eye sockets. And then it was as if I was being made to see the whole of everything at once. Everything? Yes. There was a figure directly in front of me. It was, of course, you, but it was also the godson I lost. And still again, it was my own young lost father. All of you, as it were, conflated. And that made you afraid? No, it wasn't that. There was another behind all of you, larger, older, fading back into my dreams as he brought you all forward. He seemed to be presenting you. And forgive an old man's fancy, but for a moment, I believed I could see on this other figure a bearded mouth with a half smile at its corners, the curve of shaggy limbs. The one I was unable to face was him. Unable and after all this time unworthy. In the seventh chapter of Graham's The Wind in the Willows, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, which you know well, the riverside creatures find the lost son of the otter nestling fast asleep upon an island in the stream between the hooves of his saviour, a figure left unnamed by Graham, but whose every feature and accoutrement suggests him to be Pan, the goat god, who has guided the comrades towards him with his music. I wish he could guide me. He very well may have, your person of the BBC. Was that not him too? or an aspect of him projected among us, since, as we know, one cannot look with mortal eye upon things rightly kept hidden. My dearest boy, it was he who sent you here. <sighs> I should like you to have the book. One token of remembrance in return for another of a day we are unlikely to know again. Um, no, no, I, I can't take it. it. It must be really valuable, and it's part of your collection. If you would like it, it is yours. It's very kind of you. I'm most honoured. These stories meant the world to me once. But perhaps now I shouldn't look quite so much to the past. As you wish, entirely as you wish. And besides, I, I have nothing to give in exchange. Are you forgetting that I may already have had something of yours, something for which I admit I may at the time have paid a small sum? You've got my painter. The word I used was may. And while I may once have had it, I may also since have moved it on. But as far as you are concerned, where that painting now happens to be is of little consequence. We throw forth our work to the world and there it must make its own way. The genie, do you see, the genie. Oh, now, I really must go. This has, in its way, been a kind of miracle. Hmm. I feel I've had a kind of reprieve. Walk with me. You've been... You've been very good, Morgan. Really helpful. Thank you. What else are the old for, if not to be good to the young, eh? 
I'm sure you will do exactly the same 50, 60, 70 years hence <laughs> after you have been dubbed Sir Roger Barrett for services to psychedelia. <laughs> More likely Sir Sid, I reckon. <laughs> Come here, Roger. A kiss of comradeship. It's our calling to bring a little gaiety to the world. I cannot say why it falls to the likes of us, but it does. Somewhere along the line there must be a selection, a setting apart of the goats from the sheep. We flit in and out like beads, sparrow. Yes. We poor things may be of the moment, but our work lives on. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you. Stand in the sun, Roger, <laughs> for all you are worth. And shine. Yes. Morgan Forster died in 1970, aged 90. Sid Barrett died in 2006, aged 60. The two men never met. In The Ballad of Sid and Morgan, Morgan was played by Simon Russell Beale, Sid by Tiger Drew Honey, and The Bedder by Madeline Leslie. Sound design was by Giovanni Sipiano. It was directed by Willie Richards and produced by Roger James Ellsgood. It was an art and adventure production for BBC Radio 4. <laughs>